All right, here we go. We have Darius McCrary in the house. My man. What's happening, soul brother? Everything good, man. Glad we finally made this happen. Been a long time fan. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, brother. I love what you're doing. I love the movement, man. I love the beard. You know, I played Gerald Levert, man. I had a cold beard going, man. You know, but you know, I I had to I had to take it off for all the other stuff. You know, you they, they try to keep you in a in a lane. You know, if you don't switch it up, you know. Right. I'm not on camera, so I can just let mine just keep growing that, out. That's all, you get to keep. You know what I'm saying? You get to roll however you want to, man. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, this is your first time here, so yes. I want to get into the whole story. Yeah. So you were born in Walnut, California. Yeah, well, no, actually, I wasn't born in Walnut, man. Uh, I, I resided in Walnut for a long time, man, Walnut, California. Um, but I was actually born in South, in, in, in Southern California, man. My family's from South Central. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, so, you know, um, and my family before that was from Louisiana and, um, and uh, Ohio, uh, the McCrary's. Uh, but my family's from South Central, man. So I have family ties, if you would. Um, all through South Los Angeles and uh, Florence and Normandy, where the riots started, all through uh, the '60s and, uh, and 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 you know, all through um, you know that area, man. So you know, I'm tied in. You know, Slauson, Crenshaw, uh, where the late great Nipsey Hussle, um, you know, uh, it was it was his area. Um, Jackson Limousine, Mr. Jackson, who for years has fed the homeless uh, every Thanksgiving, one of the biggest food drives in Los Angeles history. Uh, so I come from all of that. My uncle still to this day has a church called Power of Love on Normandy in Manchester, man. Uh, and he's done some amazing work. Bishop Turner, he's done some amazing work throughout the city of Los Angeles. My father, who was a uh, music director for uh, West Angeles Church of God in Christ, Bishop Charles E. Blake, who was a, a, a very uh, substantial uh, influence in, in my life, um, you know, growing up. So uh, all of that, man, through all of this. So I, I, I bleed purple and gold, um, you know, because I'm a Lakers fan, and I'm happy to see that the Lakers are back on track. Um, you know, we've gone through a whole lot of changes. You know, uh, my heart was broken when Shaq left because, uh, you know, Shaq is my man, 100 grand, you know. Um, and, you know, Kobe held it down and did what he had to do. But, uh, you know, man, it was always about the terrible two because you always had James Worthy, you always had Magic Johnson. You know, you always had Shaq, you always had Kobe. Now you got LeBron, you got AD. You know, it takes two, baby. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, Snoop Dogg and all of that, you know, LBC, you know, uh, Compton and LBC, Dr. Dre, NWA. It was a blessing to be grow- growing up in that era and to see the movement, you know, um, and all the great things that that – the greater Los Angeles area produced. Uh, great filmmakers like John Singleton, rest in peace. Um, my, my little brother Donovan McCreary actually uh, was in Boys in the Hood. He played Little Ricky, you know? Right. Yeah, man. So we grew up an entertainment uh, family, if you would, man. It, I remember it was actually one time when my mom had us all three on set. My brother, Donnie, my sister, Sarah. Uh, she'd be working on, on something and I'd be on Family Matters and my mom would be running back and forth, man. And, you know, prior to that was us watching my dad and, and mom perform and my dad and his brothers and sisters, the McCreary's, perform. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up, man, around a lot of great talent um, in a great space in, in L.A., man. I love L.A., but I am truly a renaissance man and a man of the world and a man of the people, which is why I'm in New York City. <laughs> Well, your dad, uh, Howard McCrary, is actually a Grammy-nominated gospel and jazz musician. And uh, he did arrangements for, like, Shaka Khan, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson. What did he do for Michael Jackson, exactly? So, so you know, uh, sometimes when you go into uh, Michael's discography and you listen to these songs like Man in the Mirror, you listen to these songs like Keep the Faith, you listen to these songs like Earth Song, you know, there are a lot of voices of these big choirs, you know. And, um, you know, my dad was uh, was an integral part of putting together these choirs and putting together these arrangements, you know, man. And, I, I mean, I grew up in an era in a time where, you know, man, uh, they used to have background session days where singers would go in on a day just to lay the background vocals. It was that serious what, what musicians did, you know? I mean, they even had, musicians would have load-in time to load their instruments in before they started playing, you know? And so my dad was um, was always one of the cats, man. That's what they call them, the cats. 
you know, all the cats played together, Greg Fillingains and Bobby Watson and Ricky Lawson, rest in peace, and, you know, uh, Indugo Chandler, and they were the cats, man. David Williams, rest in peace. These are the guys who made the music. And so my dad was either playing or arranging the voices. Him and my Auntie Linda, that's what they did. You know, my dad uh, has discovered a lot of talent, me included, um, you know, uh, different cats like, like the Winans, um, you know, uh, who is a family who is illustrious history, is synonymous with the gospel music and successful commercial gospel music. Um, you know, so that's what my dad did for Michael, man, you know, um, and they were really friends. In fact, uh, if it hadn't been for Michael Jackson, I wouldn't be sitting here right now because Michael actually requested that the McCrary's come to Los Angeles um, to work with, with, with them. And the McCrary's, my, my father's group, my dad, Howard, my Auntie Linda, Auntie Charity, Uncle Alfred, and Uncle Sam, they were the opening act for the Jacksons. So that's how my dad met my mother. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Okay, so you're growing up in this family of entertainers, and then you you started your Hollywood career at the age of 10, and your first film was Big Shots? Big Shots, man. That was it. That's where it all started. And it all started because my dad was, um, he was working on a production where he was doing the music uh, with Marvin Winans, um, the legendary Marvin Winans, um, and um, that's Unk. And uh, Chip Fields, Kim Fields' mom, she would see me backstage because I would always go to work with my dad. And this is why, ladies, if you've got a child, let the daddy be in, in, in a daddy. Send your child with, with his father. You know, give him that opportunity because you never know what blessings you're blocking if you don't allow that to happen. You know, and I'm so grateful I used to go to these sessions with my dad, these rehearsals with my dad. Now, in retrospect, I think my mama was kind of player hating because, you know, the ladies love my dad. So, you know, she figured if I sit him along, you know, I stop some of this, this action that this man be getting because he was a rock star. But, um, yeah, man, I, um, I was hanging out backstage in Chip Fields, Kim Fields' mother, from The Facts of Life, um, from Living Single, from, I mean, she's, she's just a living legend herself. I love you, Kim. Uh, Auntie Chip who was Penny's mom on Good Times. That's what y'all probably will know her from. She's the one that burned Penny with the iron. Um, <laughs> but so much more. I mean, car wash. I mean, she was just one of those ladies. She noticed me, and there was a role for a movie called Big Shots. She took me for an audition. And the funniest part of the story is my mother, she asked my mother if she could take me. And if she asked my mother if my mother was interested in me, uh, in me doing this. And my mother said, yeah, I'm interested if you take him. He had a chance before and he blew it. So he ain't embarrassing me no more. That's how hardcore my mama was, man. She didn't play. She was like, if you want to deal with it, you take him. <laughs> and I see Chip did. And I got the role out of 5,000 kids that read um, from L.A., Chicago, New York. They, they, they picked me, you know, by the, by the grace of God. Well, yeah. I mean, this was a pretty big film. It was a theatrical release. And it was executive produced by Ivan Reitman, who... Did Ghostbusters, Twins, Kindergarten Cop, Old School. This was like a major project, and you're actually on the poster. You're the co-star at 10 years old. How's that? Vlad, I'm still humbled by that experience, man. Like, seriously, like, I look back at that man, and sometimes I'm just filled with joy and humility, man. Like, it almost makes me want to cry, because it's like, how does this happen? Like, how do you start off with your first production, Ivan Reitman, Robert Mandel, who still to this day is one of my favorite directors in cinema history, man. Um, definitely my all-time top 10 uh, favorite directors, man, in cinema history. But it was such an experience, man. And they were just the kindest men. Michael Gross, Joe Magic, uh, Ricky Busker, you guys. By the way, Ricky, I'm going to give you a shameless plug who was the little white boy in the movie because it was a story about a little black boy and a little white boy, uh, friend, a friend movie. He has a, um, a pizza... Uh, um, restaurant. It's called Lucifer's Pizza. It's delicious pizza. It's, it's in LA now. I don't know if he's thinking about expanding. But if you go in there and you go get some Lucifer's, Lucifer's Pizza, go in there and ask for Obi. Everybody go in there and ask for Obi. Because he played Obi and I played Scam. Um, but yeah, the movie the movie premiered at the Egyptian Theater, bro. My first premiere was the Egyptian Theater. So that's why today I look at certain things. And it's not that I'm like, you know, can I cuss? 
Yeah. Go okay, ahead. cool. You know, I'm, just, I'm gonna keep it real. You know, I mean, I just want to ask. You know, it ain't that I'm shitting on anything or I'm looking down on anything, but it's like when you start off at the Egyptian theater, man, and you've gone. That's just where you started. It's like you constantly want to challenge yourself to do better. You know, so it's like. There are levels to this, you know, and and it's just an honor, man, to that that I'm able to sit down and, and, and talk to people like yourself still, and uh, and to look back, and say I gotta surpass what I did, <laughs> you know. Well, you were doing a few guest spots on TV, yes. and then you got a role in Mississippi Burning. Wow, which is, uh, I mean, that's still a very important film today. Yo, I mean, still, once again, to this day. And look, some of them guest spots were amazing because I worked with Sherman Hemsley, you know, who's a who's a legend, man. Uh, the Jeffersons, um, Ernest Thomas, what's happening? You know, what's happening now? I go back that far. But yeah, um, Mississippi Burning Man, Alan Parker, another one of my favorite all-time directors in Mississippi, um, working on this film, which was a true story. Gene Hackman, Willem Dafoe. Bro, it was just like, it was so surreal. And at the time, my mom, Miss Shay, I love you so much. Even though, you know, you weren't messing with me because I embarrassed you. I know I did. I'm sorry. But I made up for it. Um, she was just so awesome the way she handled me, you know. Um, she actually took me to Louisiana where she was born to talk to my great-grandmothers, Grandma Laura and, uh, and Ma, um, about their experience with civil rights and, and their experience, you know, dealing with what our people had come through. And so it, it prepared me. And this was a story that needed to be told. And it's a blessing because to this day, they show this movie in schools to students, you know? So it was amazing, man. Humbling. Extremely humbling. Oh, yeah. I mean, Gene Hackman is an Oscar winner. Uh, William Defoe's been nominated for Oscars a bunch of times. Uh, and, and I just remember that one scene in um, uh, Mississippi Burning where they, they ended up kidnapping, I think, the the chief of police or something, and the, the black guy had him in the room was like, he was like, yeah, you know, this guy, this black kid got kidnapped and put in a room kind of like this one. And it's like... <laughs> Dude, wasn't it great? I mean, just the way... Let me tell you some crazy history about that. And yes, that movie won Best Picture. I'm, oh. It won Best Picture, man. Ten years old and the movie went in Best Picture. But it was just so masterfully written and so wonderfully told. And uh, it made an uncomfortable situation that... We, at the time, I really believe, probably were uh, afraid to talk about uh, because there's a lot of history in this country. We, we, we don't like to talk about a, a lot. Um, and, 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 and I think that in African-American culture, we don't like to talk about a lot, too. And that, that is uh, a systemic and it's learned behavior based on our history as well. Um, but it made those uncomfortable moments comfortable. It made the elephant in the room bearable, you know. And that's the only way that I, I believe you can grow and get better you know, as, as, as a person, as a human being, you know, black, white, indifferent, whatever. That's the only way we can grow is from our mistakes. But it made, it, it made uncomfortable moments comfortable, you know? And Willem Dafoe and those guys just, God, I'll never forget, man, there was this one scene where, Will, where um, um, I had to talk to um, Willem Dafoe and Gene Hackman, and Willem Dafoe, he asked me, how come you ain't afraid? And I asked him, how come you ain't? And I'll never forget, right before the camera rolled, you know, I, I I mentioned to Mr. Hackman somehow or another how, why would, you know, I, I say this to, to these men who were here to protect us, you know, because I was a little bit uncomfortable and he saw that. And, and he said, he said, because sometimes the only way to make a difference is to be fearless, kid. He said, so you, you got to be fearless. You're, you're, you're a hero. And, and, and I said, so how do I act like a hero? And he said to me, don't act. Be. I'm like, dude, as a kid soaking this up, like, whoa. And I took that with me for every role from, from, from then on. You know? So. Well, I, I just want to correct you real quick because I actually looked it up as we were talking. Uh, Mississippi Burning won Best Cinematography. Yes, Oscar it did. That You're year. Right. It was nominated for Best Picture, yes, but was. Rain Man won Best Picture that year. Oh, we lost to Rain Man. My bad. You're right. <laughs> not a, not oh, a bad movie Sonnenberg. to lose to. Oh, you're right. It did. <laughs> hey, speaking of, that's crazy because the gentleman who was a cinematographer on Big Shots, he did Amadeus, 
And he won Best Picture, uh, I mean, the Best Cinematographer for Amadeus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, still, still a huge, a huge accomplishment. So then came Family Matters. Yeah, man. Okay. So you signed on to be Eddie Winslow. I did. And uh, the show was created by William Bickley and Michael Warren. Yes. So you said that you believe that the Eddie Winslow character was written on there because of Theo from the Huxtables. Okay, okay wait, Vlad, let me correct you. I, I, it's my belief, looking back, that there was a show on NBC called The Cosby Show. Uh, ABC, in all of their wisdom and their, their grand understanding knew that they needed to uh, have a show that could service the African-American community and all of the sponsors that, uh, that supported their network. So they created a slot for an African-American family show. And just me gathering, being a historian and, and, a, and an absolute student of the game, listening to the stories from Bill Bickley, listening to the stories from Michael Warren, listening to Tom and Bob, you know, they had a deal in place. And Bill and, and Michael, it took them seven years to really get this deal in place. And Tom and Bob were the gatekeepers who opened the door. So based on a need uh, for, for service, because that's what we do as entertainers. We are here as, as, as public servants, man. And anybody else who has it twisted, you know, I, 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 you know, I feel for you. Um, this is hell living in your own ego. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, man, it's my belief that they... Um, they created this show because they knew that there was going to be a need uh, for, for, for that, 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 uh, that slot to be filled. And that's what happened. And so, yeah, you know, they had Theo on, on the Cosby show, and there was an a, 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 a African-American son by the name of Eddie, you know, um, on, on Family Matters. But the beauty of this show, man, is that you could have taken the same show and you could have put a white cast in um, these same roles and it would not have made a difference. Now, I do believe that because it was a black show, it was received exceedingly and abundantly beyond expectations. I will say that. Because, you know, it's supply and demand. There were no little black boys that looked like me on, on TV at that time, man. You know, I mean, Malcolm, we resembled each other, you know, to a degree, but there was only two when you really look back. It's only the network was only it was only ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox came along. There's only four networks back then, man. You know, and 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 if you think about it, back then CBS didn't have nobody that looked like me on it back then. Right, and you know, on the show, Carl Winslow, who plays you know who's the the father character on the show, is actually a police officer. Now, how was that initially? you know, viewed considering black people's history with the police in man. America? Man, that's a deep question. Um, you know, uh, man, I think honestly people look past that uh, being that we were just a family and we had storylines that applied to being family. I think that people look past it being uh, a police, him being a police officer and they accepted him and uh, Harriet Winslow, uh, who was played by Joe Marie Payton, my mother, um, on the show, they looked at them as just blue-collar workers, and we were a blue-collar family. And I think that's what made us a bit more acceptable than the Cosbys, because, you know, everybody's not going to have a doctor as a father and a, and a, and a, and a mother uh, who's a lawyer. But, you know, you might have uh, a father that is a construction worker, you know, a mother who works in a deli, you know, uh, a mother who is uh, a, 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 a secretary or an executive assess assistant, you know, a father who uh, does work for the police department. And I think that we were able to to communicate and to to touch a place in in the hearts of America, which belong to everyday people. Well, the show starts off and uh, early in the first season. They introduce Steve Urkel. My man. And he kind of became the star of the show. Hey, man. Listen, when you on a rocket ship to the moon, you don't care who your pilot is. Even if he is a little a little, little 12-year-old kid, man. If he can drive that thing, drive that thing. You know, I'm going to tell you another character who, who came in who wasn't supposed to be written in was Waldo Geraldo Faldo. Sean Harrison, man. He was another one. He showed up one line. 
and killed it. You know, and so, you know, you bringing it up, man. This takes me back to the days where producers would see real talent and they respected it. And they were like, sign the kid. You know, and Jay was just such, and still is, man, just such a genius, man. You know, um, I might surprise a lot of people, but we still have to audition for a lot of roles. You know, um, um, sometimes you got to prove to people that you can still do it. And uh, it, it can be difficult, um, you know, at times. But Jay and I, man, we go on an audition and we run lines together. And it trips people out. We see each other on audition. He said, man, come on, man, let's run this. And, you know, I say, man, that was real cold what you did. You know, but because I know how his style is and what he does, I said, Jay, this would be great if you, if you took this moment here and you did X, Y, Z. And he's like, that's dope, D, I got you. You know, and we work together like that. We, we talk, you know. Um, I think I just put up a post today on Instagram about uh, James Brown. And uh, he hit me and he was like, man, way to transform, bro. He was just like, they don't even know. He was like, dude, you can do anything, dude. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, Jaleel's a genius, man. He was just so amazing. And just watching him work, uh, us working together, it's just something that only comes along once in a lifetime. I mean, I'm so blessed. So blessed, man. Well, I looked it up. A bunch of actors actually got their first start on this show, one of which is Terrence Howard. Yes. Yes, man. Terrence, I love Terrence, man. Terrence, to this day, whenever he sees me, man, he reminds me of how I treated him when he came on set. He said, man, you treated me like a star from day one, man. I said, man, I mean, that, that's who you are. You could look at him back then. And, and you knew, man, and the way he carried himself, man, and he was just such a real brother, you know. Um, i never forget, man, um, I, I, and I did. I made sure he had his own, at one point, uh, I made sure he had had, had the, the dressing room that, that he wanted, you know. Um, just because, man, sometimes when, when you're in an environment, people don't understand what we have to go through creatively. And one of the, the beautiful things is, you know, some people want to be close to the stage so that they can feel the energy. Some people want to be away from the stage so that they don't have to hear what's going on so that they can get to their moment. And all these things play an important part. Some people like to go to makeup after they put on the clothes, you know, because then they f start to feel like the character. Some people want to go to makeup right before they go on, you know. Uh, some people like to come to set completely ready. Everybody has different methods of moving. And one of the things that I've been blessed to do is to experience all these different entertainers before Family Matters and all these certain special moments before, you know, even Mississippi Burning by being around my dad, you know, you're in a room with Michael Jackson, man. You imagine what the energy is like, man, when you're watching Michael, man, and he's you're watching this man create. It's just like, brother, I, I, I can't even explain it, man. You know, you're hanging out with Rick James, or, you know, you know, Shaka Khan in a room, you know, you're in the same room with Sammy Davis Jr. It's just, it's inexplicable. You know, so Terrence, man, he was a real artist even back then. He took everything so serious. He took everything so serious. Vivica Fox was on the show. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, man. Um, Sherman Hemsley, LaWanda Page. I mean, we had some of the most amazing. My brother Donovan McCrary, who played Spider. Larry Johnson, uh, who was Grandma Ma at the time. We had some of the most amazing guest star roles, man. But Terrence, I will say this, man. You never called me for an episode of uh, Empire, man, but I won't hold that against you because I know, man, I know how difficult it has been to man that ship. We've talked about it, brother, so it's all good. Well, uh, Orlando Brown actually showed up on the show the last two seasons. He did, man. That's baby boy, man. Um, God, he, 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 that, that's another one. Orlando is just so extremely talented. Um, and you know, man, I'm gonna say this. Um, for all child actors, uh, who have gone through this gambit and who've been able to survive and navigate. Uh, it, it's, there's some of the rockiest waters, some of the, the most dastardly, nasty, um, and, 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 and difficult um, waters to navigate through. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of Orlando. I'm glad to see that he's, you know, is, is pulling himself together and that uh, he's weathering the storm. Because, you know, two things a champion will never do. A champion will never never get tired. A champion ain't gonna never quit. Well, yeah, I mean, I've interviewed Orlando uh, a couple of times, and I mean, he's definitely gone through some very serious issues, some very serious mental issues, drug issues. What do you mean to say 
like Raven did when she was black? I mean, I told you in the first interview. I mean, she gave me, and then I gave her some. Um, legal issues, uh, the whole the whole gamut, really. I don't know quite where he is right now. I mean, he kind of went off the, the the deep end at one point and said a bunch of crazy stuff about us, and then he DM me and apologized and. I mean, I'm not quite sure where he is, but it's sad to see someone who who had so much potential and was in so many really cool projects to be to be where he is right now. Yeah, well, he he's got some great music. Um, you know, Vlad. Unfortunately, man, people learn after a certain point in time that this business does has so little to do with your talent, and so much to do with what you do with your talent. Um, it's called show business, and unfortunately, when you're when you are indoctrinated into this business as a child, you're just doing something that you love, man. You know, it's like playing on a playground. You know, you're not, you, you, it's, like, it's like a dog doing tricks. You do a trick and you want a treat. You know what I'm saying? That, really, I mean, I hate to break it down like that. You know, I'll never forget when I, I lost my first job I got fired from. Man, it was a show called Designing Women. And ironically, Designing Women was a Warner Brothers show and it was, it was filmed through, two stages down it was right next door to where they filmed Space Jam, and we were on the other side of that stage, Family Matters. And I'm telling you this story for a reason. I came off of doing Mississippi Burning, and I, an intense film, man, where people are hanging. I had my arm fractured by being kicked, man, in a scene. Man, crosses burning. Mississippi, people protesting because they didn't want the story told. Following us home to the hotel, man. And I had to go on the Warner Brothers lot, and make an adjustment and be funny and tell the jokes and hanging around the designing women, Meshach Taylor and Delta Burke and all these beautiful women, Annie Potts and all these, these amazing people. I'm walking around the set. Now I'm, 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 I'm inside of a sound stage. We're outside in the mud, man, fire burning. I'm taking my daddy down from a tree, right? And I have to be funny. The director never once took the time to spend a moment with me to say, listen, man, I need you to talk loud. I need you to be happy. I'm shell-shocked, man. I really honestly needed some, some, some therapy after this, low-key. But back then, we didn't have bipolar disorder. We wasn't diagnosed with nothing. It would just get your ass back, back out there, boy. You, you, you wasn't never going to go, right? You know, you was just a bad kid, right? If, if you had certain issues. It wasn't none of this. Man, they fired me. And you know who they replaced me with? This is the game we in. They replaced me with... Shavar Ross, who ended up playing Weasel on the show years later, who was on different strokes for years as Dudley, right? Who had done that type of acting. But nobody took the time with me, man. Now, my mama, once again, Miss Shay, I love you. She's so cold, man. She came into the dressing room. She said, come on, baby, get your things. We're going home. I said, oh, we're going home? She said, yeah. I said, okay, um, well, well, what, time, what time do we come back? She said, we're not coming back, baby. Um, they're letting us go. And she let me feel that moment. Now, luckily, I had the kind of love around me coming up, you know, in the family that I did, and it wasn't like I was the, the breadwinner for the family. We didn't need this job. I had the kind of mama who would allow me to experience this pain to become the man that she knew I would have to be. You know, everybody comes up in different environments. You know, um, uh, I'm going to be real, real honest, man. You know, um, you know, Orlando had a single parent mother. You know, he came up without a father, man. You know, so I'm not making excuses for anybody. But all of these things play a factor. You know, Brighton McClure on the other side. I call him the Emmy winner. That's Lil Richie. You know, um, Brighton had his mother and his father. You know, um, and... Uh, and it, 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 it's difficult, man. Sometimes you get caught up in the intoxication of so-called success. So, you know, you just got to remember, man, it, it, it's, it's all a blessing. And uh, we're going to pray for Orlando and, 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 and pray that he will continue to stay on the right track, man. And, you know, everybody is able to have these relationships with, with outlets, with press outlets like this, man. I mean, like, you know, you and I, we got on the phone and we talked before, man, and it's all cool, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's love, you know? I mean... But sometimes we feel attacked as well, you know? And, and, and um, 
you know, bottom line is, man, this is how we feed our families. Well, when the show first started, there was a character that was played by Jamie Foxworth. Yes. Which was the younger sister, Judy Winslow. Yes. And then at one point, she just disappeared off the show, and you guys just stopped mentioning her altogether. Uh, what happened to that character? So what happened to Jamie Foxworth, man, once again, you know, like I just said, she was a product of her environment as well. And Kelly Williams, who's my sister on Family Matters, we go back and forth about this all the time. You know, Kelly, you know, I love you so much, Kelly, and you know I do, but you know how I feel about um, showbiz kids. It's hard, man, and sometimes a parent, you know, can be uh, your, a, a stage parent, can be your, your greatest advocate, or become your greatest enemy. There's so many cases where you wonder what happened to this kid. And it wasn't the kid's talent. It was the parent. You know, and I'm not blaming Jamie's mother. I'm not saying what she did was wrong or how she handled things is wrong. Um, but sometimes you have to be grateful um, that you have the opportunity uh, uh, to showcase your talent and wait for greater opportunities to come along. You know, and um, I, I feel that um, at the time, Jamie's mother felt that her character was being underserviced. And, you know, um, I, the, the producers took it as a slap in the face. And unfortunately, um, you know, it put Jamie in a very difficult position. You know, if this was in today's world, you know, you would have been able to start a social media campaign and, you know, drum up some type of hype and, you know, and everything. Now stuff is going viral and now another network will want to hire you or they might bring you back, you know, or there's other situations you, you, you could create. You could do skits. You could do so much. But back then we were very limited, you know, and um, there was a lot of control that the networks had and executives had, you know, and rightfully so. I mean, these people live with these shows. Like I told you, Family Matters was seven years before we even were materialized as the actors to play these roles. So who am I to come in and tell these people what they're going to do with their show? You know, who am I? Well, after Jamie was let go from the show, she ended up not really getting a lot, a lot more roles. And she actually ended up doing adult films. She did. Uh, under, under the name Crave. She did. I mean, have you seen her lately? Go to her Instagram. I mean, she's Crave. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to say anything incestuous, but I look at her sometimes and I'm like, I crave. <laughs> she grew up to be hot. <laughs> um, and look, man, we look at porn as like it's a bad thing, man. You know, when you go to Europe, they show frontal nudity in their programming. And what they don't allow is showing you taking human life. You can't shoot somebody in a show Oh, that's over in Europe. You know, so I think it's all about socialization. I mean, listen, um, the hell, I mean, who doesn't watch porn? I mean, I don't watch porn anymore because it leads to a whole lot of other things in my world. So I, I leave that shit alone. But there was a time when I used to love to watch it. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, the ladies used to love to watch it with me. You know? um, and I'm proud of her, you know, and, and I have seen the video and she did an amazing job. And um, <laughs> it is what it is, you know, I mean. Hell, I mean, I've made a couple of personal porns myself. They haven't been released yet, but if they find their way to the airwaves, you heard it here first. <laughs> well, and then Harriet Winslow, uh, the mother, got replaced in the last season. Man, that was hard. That was really difficult. Um, yeah, Joe Marie, uh, who the show was created for, technically. A lot of people don't know this, but it was a spinoff from Perfect Strangers. She left the show. Um, just because of differences with the producers, once again. Um, but like I said, who am I to tell these people what they're going to do with their show, even if you created it for me, you know? Um, she left because of, of, of several differences, and she was replaced by a wonderful actress who I don't think ever was received the way that she should have been for her talent because she had to come in um, under such adverse circumstances bearing such a heavy load. You know, um, Judy, Judy Ann was a wonderful actress um, and a beautiful person. Um, but, you know, once again, you know, with a show that has success like Family Matters had, man, you know, um, you, you get accustomed to a certain taste and you, you want to taste those ingredients that make up that, that, that composition that you are so used to, uh, to partaking in every Friday night. Well, the show ended after nine years. Yeah. 
And although you had other gigs, this was like your biggest gig up to this point in your life. How did it feel for it to just end after that long of a time? Man, watching Family Matters end, especially the way it ended, was one of the most difficult things that I think um, I, I, I ever um, have experienced. Um, I love those people, man. I love the cast. Um, I love the producers. You know, it's like saying bye to family members, man. And some of them family members you never see again. It's heartbreaking, man. It's hard. And then I'm going to be real, um, especially being, like, African-American, um, being black, you know, in the gang, you know, it don't happen like that. You don't see that. That's why there, there are only certain shows that, that are even comparable to that, you know. Um, and it's a short list, you know. And I'm not saying anything against anybody else who's done it. I mean, we're now the third longest running African American show because of Tyler Perry's uh, House of Pain. But you have to understand the way Tyler Perry's show was done is not even in the same atmosphere, stratosphere as Family Matters. It's not even the same. It's no disrespect to Mr. Perry. He's, he's done an amazing um, uh, job at what he's accomplished. Um, you know, and I wish him all the best with all of his endeavors. Tyler Perry Studios is amazing. It's an amazing accomplishment. But um, with, with, with Tom Miller and Bob Boyer did with, with uh, Bill Bickley and Michael Warren, it just doesn't happen, especially with black folks. It, it don't happen like that. I mean, you name me a show. I mean, what, you got the Jeffersons? What, what show would you put up there? The Cosby, Cosby show? Sh Cosby show. Cosby show. The uh, Different World, I thought, was a good show. Absolutely. Different World was amazing. Mm -hmm. Which one had that, uh, that type of crossover success to where you could plug in white cast members and it would still be like growing pains? Yeah. What? Oh, it, was a, it was a great show. You know, it was a great show. They, 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 those guys are visionaries. Well, you know, Jaleel White, who played Urkel, said that if you ever see me do the Urkel character again, just take me out and put a bullet in my head and put me out of my misery. But, but then there was talk of a reboot. So which one is it? This is the thing, man. Everybody has to understand about this. Um, we are never going to be able to go back and, and give you guys that feeling that we that, that you had because we were all moving together at a, in, in a certain point in time. We were all growing together. You know, so we're going to have to touch, touch your heart in places that speak to where we are now as, as uh, adults who've grown up together. We grew up. You know, I mean, you grew up with me. Only difference is I couldn't see you. So... There, there, there's an affinity, you know what I'm saying? But what it does is it allows me to embrace you because of your empathy, because of, 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 of um, your enthusiasm. It allows me to embrace those fans. So I think with Jay, man, Jay don't want to disappoint nobody because what he did is just, bro, like, I don't, ain't nobody ever did it. Ain't, I, I, I don't, that dude, man, that dude played three, four characters, man. That dude, man... That's one of the baddest dudes, man. That dude, one of the baddest dudes, man, as far as the game is concerned, and it's so underappreciated, man. In my in my opinion, you know, um, you know, but it's 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 a marathon, not a sprint. So you know, we still got 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 a lot more to run, I believe. So I don't think that Jay wants to disappoint anybody by putting suspenders on and not being able to make you feel what he made you feel. So you know, we are in talks, some things that could possibly happen. You know, um, I think that uh, one day. Uh, uh, Y'all pulled up on me. I was on Sunset, and I was headed uh, uh, over to see uh, J Dub. You know, that's what I call him. You know, he said we too old for nicknames, but uh, you know, and I said you know some things never change. So I was on my way to see the Dub. You know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, and we, we we were talking about working some things out. You know, and then Sean and Kelly and myself. Um, you know, Cherry Johnson. That's my boo. You know what I'm saying? You know that's. You know, that's, that's, that's the wifey. So, you know, Cherry, she on board regardless. She ain't got no choice. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we, you know, we, we, we working on some things. It wouldn't be a reboot. It'd be a remix. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, the show is currently streaming on Hulu. And, you know, when you look at, for example, the Cosby show, the all the Cosby show kids, from what I understand... Bill Cosby made sure they had really good deals coming into the show with, with residuals and royalties and everything else like that. Did you sign a good deal when you were on that show to the point where you're still making money off that show today, or was the, the deal not so great? 
hey man, you know, um, all I can tell you is life is good, man. <laughs> you know, that's all I can tell you is life is good. Um, we didn't have a Mr. Cosby looking over us. Um, we walked into a situation that uh, created some serious opportunity. Um, my mother did the best that she could. She was amazing. I mean, uh, I'm now with with some great representation. You know, um, you know. Shout out to Andrew Ruff. Um, uh, who's just an amazing guy. Um, you know, my squad, um, the whole squad. But it was a different time back then. You know, so. But I can tell you, life is good, and that's why I just continue to work, man. You know, I, I feel blessed. I just played James Brown uh, on American Soul which is something I never, ever thought would have happened. And this is, this is why you have to let people do their jobs. Robbie Reed, I love you. <laughs> Robbie Reed, she cast me in Muhammad Ali, as Muhammad Ali in the Don King story. She cast me in Next Day Air. And she always puts me in Kingdom Come as Royce. She always puts me in these roles, and I'm like, I just don't see it. Um, you know, it, and there's sometimes where I've talked myself out of roles. When Robbie's wanted to see me, I'd be like, Robbie, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to come in here and, and come do this. There's so many other roles I'm sure I would have got if I would have just showed up. But she sees it. You know, casting directors like Leah Daniels Butler, who's, um, who's another amazing. She, you know, she casts Empire and, and Star and um, so many others. She's coming to America, too. She, you didn't let me be African in that, but it's okay. I still love you anyway. <laughs> I couldn't have been African. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just want to have one more question in terms of like this era uh, of your career. There was a, a TMZ interview where you said that you were inappropriately touched by a Hollywood executive. Uh, I assume as as a child. Can you talk about that at all? You know, man. This is the thing, Vlad. Um, I f I feel like when I said that statement, I was defending a very good friend of mine who was under some serious fire and some allegations. And, I, and who, who, who was that? Who I, were you defending at the time? I, I'd rather not really speak on him, you know. Um, I mean, okay. if you must know, Charlie Sheen for president. That's all I can say. But anyway, okay. um, um, that's my dog. Um, uh, and it was some serious allegations going around. And it was a lot swirling. And I knew some things about some people, and I, I, I knew some bodies were buried, and I wasn't going to speak on it. And all I was saying is we've all, if you're in this business, we've all at some point been inappropriately touched. At some point. Even if it's a hug, even if it's a back rub. I don't know what you're thinking when you're rubbing my back. You could be hugging, hugging my back and be like, oh, my God, this big, strong buck. Oh, Lord, Jesus, Lord, if I could just. And, and I'm, 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 a, I'm oblivious. I'm thinking this is a great person. They're going to produce something for me. That's inappropriate. I don't know what's on your mind. So looking back, in retrospect, I do remember a situation where I was touched a certain way. Being too young to decipher I, I, I didn't pay it any, any attention. Years later, now that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it, I was touched in a different situation, and I remember what that touch was. Now, I never told my mother. I never said anything about it, you know, uh, because you, you didn't. And, and that's as far as I'm, I'm going to go on it, you know. I mean, I, I might, you know, one day write a book and, and, and put more details, but I do feel like this. I feel like that happened to me years ago. And if I were to bring it up now and go after that individual for my, my, my justice, I don't think ruining that person's life would be right in my situation, under my standard of living, because I was able to make it through. Now, some people crumble. Some people don't make it through. It ruins some people's life. Has it hurt me? Yes, it has. Would I like to go back and find this individual who is still a very successful uh, executive and have a moment and talk with them and ask them, what that meant, I would, I would like to do that. I would like to do that, but I'm not gonna handle it publicly. I'm not gonna ruin somebody's life publicly. The okay, Hollywood's so been this good is a, to me, you know. Okay, so this is a male that, that touched you. I decline to state. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but fair enough. But but I, I've been tested appropriately by males and females, <laughs> and, and it's a female executive. <laughs> has done some things 
how to climb a state. <laughs> okay. Well, after the show ended, you continued uh, to do work on a regular basis. Uh, you were on the NBC, NBC show Committed. You were on Eve. Uh, you did the Kingpin miniseries. You know, you mentioned the Don King, Only in America. Uh, you were in Kids in the Woods, uh, Vampires, Los Muertos. Um, you took over Shamar Moore's role in Young and the Reckless. Uh, Young and the Restless. Young and the Reckless. We've been pretty reckless too. <laughs> <laughs> Young and the Reckless. It's, I love it's it. appropriate. <laughs> that, yeah, that was a pretty, yeah. That was that was kind of funny. I, I did. I did. I did. Young and the Restless, man. And shout out to Christoph St. John, who's one of the best people God ever created, who passed away top of the year, man. It was just heartbreaking. Um, uh, he's still to this day the longest African American uh, leading male to star in a television series. And uh, he's just a, it was just a gem of a guy, man. Just an amazing, amazing dude. Right. You were also the voice of Autobot Jazz in The Transformers. Yes. So you were just getting work. Yeah, man. And that's what I'm saying. That's why I say when I look back, man, I, I, I focused on the work, you know, and I was able to... Um, I was able to, to make it through, man. You know, and it's just been a blessing. You know, um, being a part of all these 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 great projects, man. I mean, working with, um, you know, um, uh, Michael Mann, you know, who directed uh, uh, Transformers, and Mr. Spielberg, man. It's just like I said, man. I mean, the only person I really like to compete with is myself. I look back and I continue to say, how can I surpass any and everything that I've ever been blessed to do? You know. Well, you saw Rick James for the last time, and there's kind of a story around that. Can you talk about that? Yeah, man. Uh, Rick, God, he was just so special. Um, nice to call him, call him Papa Rick. Uh, he's my godfather, man. Uh, he's my, I, I'm, I'm his illegitimate godson. And you ask how you become an illegitimate godson. It's because your parents are like, no. <laughs> he's like, I'm Rick James. He's mine. <laughs> so we were hanging out, man. He was working on this session uh, with um, with Kanye West, man. Uh, and um, and it was the last recording session. And I was actually doing the show committed. And um, I was uh, we had finished the session. He wanted me to come back to the house. And he was sitting down, man, on the floor. And he told me. I was gonna tell this story. And he asked me to, to, to stay. He was telling me, you know, talking to me like he used to always tell me about the, the producing the Temptations and all the great days of Motown and working with Smokey and, you know, Prince. How, and just telling me all of his stories, you know, he used to, which I used to soak up. You know, and giving me great advice too. Um, you know, cause he never wanted to see me make the mistakes he made. And he was sitting on the floor drinking his milk, which he used to like to do. And he said, Come on, just 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 hang a little bit longer. And I said, Pop, I said I got to go, man. I got this new job. I got to be on time. He said, oh, You're a star. You're fine. You, you, you'll be fine. And I said, Pop, I got to go, man. I got I, I, I got to get on get on in so I can get ready. He said, All right, fine. Leave me then. He said, You're gonna tell everybody about this story one day. You're gonna tell them how he was sitting on the floor drinking his milk, and he asked me not to leave, and I left. And I said, why would you do that? Why do you do that kind of shit, man? That's not cool. I said, I don't want to hear that. He said, just go. He said, you got, you got your room here. And so I went back over to him, and I, 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 I grabbed him, and I, I held him, I kissed him on his forehead. And um, uh, next morning, um, I was on set, and ironically, my mother, my mother had uh, Sean Harrison, Waldo, he was with me. And because uh, he's a great acting coach, man, brilliant. He, he was actually coaching me on this job. Uh, she told him to keep me away from the TV and get my cell phone so nobody could get a hold of me. Because this is before cell phones, you were able to text or really pass messages. We, you know, you remember them days. Um, uh, and and uh, somehow or another, uh, the, the young lady I was dating at the time, who was very close with... Uh, with the family that got a hold of me somehow or another. Very close with Rick's family as well, um, which is deep, man. And uh, and he was gone. And that, that that's 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 the story I'm left with. Thanks a lot, Papa Rick. <laughs> well, I, 
I guess you had said that the Dave Chappelle skits were, were pretty much spot on. Yo, like, man. Talking about Rick James. Yo, man. He was a trip. That dude was a trip, man. I mean, him and Charlie had an amazing relationship. Him and Eddie have an amazing had an amazing relationship. Um, and that was that was him. I mean, he used to just, you know, I, I was laughing. I was on the phone with Val Young. She was uh, the original Mary Jane girl. She sang all the vocals for Tupac to live and die in L.A. Uh, she was his his really his, one of his first artists. She did all his background vocals, and we were just cracking up. You know, at just the stuff that he used to get into. But that was him. That was him, man. From a whole other place, man. You know, but that was when entertainers were allowed to be. We were allowed to just be, man. You know, it's crazy when you think of now. We got all these rules, all these regulations. And you want me to stand up on a stage in front of 20,000 people, project my voice, take you to a place that makes you feel something, talk to all the musicians, play this these instruments that, 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 that produce this different language, and then you want to tell me, to live in this box. You want me to sit in front of a camera, stand in front of a camera, act as if I'm somebody else in a scenario that's being created from another person's mind, make you feel something that you couldn't feel unless otherwise uh, you were directed and you want me to live in this box. And one thing about it was Papa Rick never lived in the, in the box. You know, him, Bobby Womack, uh, who's one of the greatest soul singers to ever touch the planet, uh, they didn't live in a box. Michael Jackson didn't live in a box, you know? And this is when these entertainers were allowed to inspire. And I think moving outside that box is what inspires everyone else, you know, to uh, to be able to reach beyond what they're told they're capable of grasping. Well, I guess there was a story about him running into Eddie Murphy's fountain. <laughs> You've done your homework, Vlad. You're good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he tore that fountain up, man. We were at Eddie's house. And um, it was after one of Eddie's big premieres. And, and you know, um, it was winding down. And the crazy thing about this story is he was completely sober. Matter of fact, we were drinking Odul's beer. I was drinking Odul's with him. Because he used to like to show me that you could, you don't have to party, you know, all the time. <laughs> To have a good time. So we were drinking Odul's beer. I'll never forget this. And so we were leaving, and he had this brand new fly ass Mercedes, man. It was one of the big ones. And um, <laughs> um, he said, we were leaving, we said bye to Eddie. And find, Eddie was just such a gracious host. He was sitting down, he finally decided to eat his food, you know. And so he was sitting down, he was, <sighs> it was a good night. Everything came off right. And so, Papa Rick says to me, give me the keys. I'm, I'm going to drive. And I look. I said, huh? He said, I'm going to drive. I, I said, well, Papa Rick, you know, because he had a stroke, you know, and, and it, it para left, left half, it, one side of his body paralyzed. So, you know, um, man, he said, I was driving before you were a fuck. Give me the keys. So when he got like that, I used to be like, all right, man, fine. So it was him, me, and his daughter, Ty, Ty James. We were in the car. Man, he threw the car in reverse, and it, he started the car, threw the car in reverse. Next thing I knew, just <laughs> and Eddie, it was this beautiful courtyard, beautiful fountain. Looked like something that came from the Venetian, the real Venetian, something that came from Italy. The, he must have got this, this shit from the Vatican. It was just gorgeous. It had these beautiful ladies holding up, and man, all I remember was water, just water, like we had driven the car underground, man. And so he, he, he put the car, uh, uh, moved the car a little bit forward to get off a little bit of a rubble. The car was kind of stuck, so water was still coming down. He gets out the car. He looks around. He says, Ty gets out. He says, everybody good? Ty, <laughs> we're like, yeah, we okay. He says, good. Quick. Get back in the car. Let's go. <laughs> Wait, so he just drove off after hitting Eddie Murphy's fountain? No, man, no. I honestly wish we would have, because I think Eddie really held it against me. And really, um, so Ty goes, Daddy, we can't do that. And so he goes, all right, you're right, come on. And, and he says, come on, D, let's go, let's go talk to Eddie. I said, huh? I said, Let, let's, and us? Nah, man, that's on you. You have to drive. 
I gave you the keys. That's on you. <laughs> he said, bring your black ass. <laughs> so we go inside. Eddie's just cool, man. Eddie's one of the coolest cats you could ever ever be around. Like, I'm talking about he's just so cool all the time, man. You know, nothing really rattles him. Um, we go back inside, and he's sitting down eating his food. And uh, he comes back inside, and Rick says, Eddie, something terrible happened. <laughs> And he stops eating. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, what did you do? <laughs> it's cool as shit. And he's like, what do you mean what did I do? It was, it, was, it was a situation. It was this car that came through the first gate, picked up speed through the second gate. It was a chick. She looked like she was driving. She looked really mad. She was really mad, man. She came in and she just demolished the gate, spun out, turned around, did a donut, and flew back down the driveway. <laughs> And Eddie's so cool, man. He says, Rick, but never looked up. Did you tear up my fountain? <laughs> Rick said, what? He said, did, did you wreck my fountain? <laughs> he goes, he goes, well, Darius let me drive. <laughs> And uh, Eddie just, once again, was so cool. He said, he told me, he said, man, get the keys from him. Don't ever let him drive again. He said, he said, um, Rick, you know, if this was my new house, I would have shot you in your good leg. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, Eddie, I'm sorry, man. I said, damn, man, where's Charlie when we need him, huh? <laughs> Charlie went there that night, and we rolled out. <laughs> ah, hilarious. Hilarious, man. I wish I would have gotten to interview him before he passed. Very he would have loved you. He would have loved you, man. Uh, he just, he was just so, uh, just unequivocally un uh, voiced, man. You know, uh, I learned a lesson, you know, talk about living out loud. My life is an open secret, you know, uh, because of Rick James. You know, it is what it is. It ain't how you start, it's how you finish. Well, at one point you started dating Corinne Stephens. I did. AKA Superhead. Hey man, that's Corinne. Corinne, we call Corinne. her Corinne. Yes. Corinne. Yes. Well, I actually produced the Kiss and Tail documentary that you're in. You did that? I was the producer, yeah. I wasn't the director. But uh, the original interviews came from me, and the concept came from me. Right. I, I so y'all came to the studio to interview me when I when I, I, I made the statement that sometimes you, you know, uh, you, you end up with an opto recto neurorectomology, and that's when right. your brain get crossed with your eyelids, and you have a shitty outlook on life. <laughs> <laughs> that ended up being a very tumultuous relationship for you. Yeah, man. I'm gonna tell you this, Vlad. I really feel like this. In Hollywood, I feel like celebrities should date celebrities, period. And, I, and it took me years to arrive at this conclusion. I don't care if it's an actor dating a singer. I don't care if it's a, a model. Um, you cannot be in, especially now where Hollywood has gone with social media, you know, because I mean, we were just at the beginning stages of things going viral at, at the time. And, you know, man, once again, when someone reaches a certain level of success and all of a sudden they find themselves flailing because they're not getting the attention, a lot of times people will do anything to maintain that attention, you know, and now we call it clout chasing. Um, um, you know, it was a very tumultuous relationship because we were young. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a certain je ne sais quoi, um, you know, that, that, that has been known to affect the the fairer sex in certain ways uh, to where reactions, you know, can be adverse. I mean, but you have to understand, man. I mean, look, if you give a woman a little bit of money, she gives you a home. You know, you give her a little bit of a little bit of, uh, of food, you know, she gives you a meal. You know, uh, you give her, uh, you know, you, 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 you give her your body, she produces a baby. So if you give her any shit, you gonna get a shit storm. 
You know, and at the time, man, I wasn't aware enough to understand that beautiful women are like exotic cars. You know, they take a lot of maintenance. I mean, you get a Rolls Royce, man, the brake job is $10,000 alone. You know, so you can't just run a Rolls Royce, you know, if you're not expecting to pay for that brake job. You know, so um, it was a very expensive and tumultuous situation, man, and you know, it's pretty much the reason why I don't drive a Rolls Royce to this day. Well, you had a, a quote, and it, it was mentioned in the documentary. You said, if you could turn a hoe into a housewife, Corinne would be the one. Pretty much. Yeah, man. Um, because, you know, at the time, um, I, I and I feel this way about most women who have had um, difficult walks of life. They're very appreciative. Most women are very appreciative when they do come across something um, that is worth having and they'll fight for it and they want to keep it because they know what the alternative is. You know, um, like I said, they take scraps and they make a meal. You know, um, they take a little bit of money and, 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 and they make, make a home, you know. Um, so, you know, Corinne had all those qualities, man. The thing that was difficult for us is, like I said, you know, um, it's just hard for some people to turn off, to turn, turn it off. You know, um, and you have to decide when you're going to allow yourself to be opened up to the public and when you're going to take time to work on yourself. And, and, and um, you know, and man, it's just hard. You look at all the relationships, you know, that, that are put out there in public. I mean, like a, a couple of strongest, Linda Hogan and Hulk Hogan, you know, uh, as many years as she had been with him through all of the WWF to now the WWE and this legend, they couldn't even do it, man, you know. And um, the business is just really a trip. It'll, 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 it'll make things very, very, very difficult, man, where relationships are concerned, which is why I really believe that entertainers should be with entertainers, period. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that stood out during those interviews uh, in the documentary was, the, was the, the Bobby Brown story, where you actually ran into Bobby Brown. <laughs> and uh, he was like, what are you doing with her? And you're like, same thing you were doing with her. Like, <laughs> Blake, I just you found good. That, that line kind of funny. You good, man. You do your homework. You good. <laughs> you know what's so funny about that? I was just talking to uh, to George Clinton about that that night. We were actually at a, a George Clinton concert. He was another one of my greatest mentors. Um, and everybody was so shocked when I walked into the room with her. And that, that really did happen. Everybody was like, whoa. I mean, she was looking hot, man. I mean, she's a gorgeous woman, man. She's beautiful. I mean, she's amazing in so many ways. Look, what attracted me to in wasn't her body. It was her mind. So you put that kind of mind into that kind of body, it's dangerous, man. I mean, we fell in love, man. We were headed 95 going south, man, on the interstate, man. I mean, we, 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 you know, it was, it was, it was amazing, man. And, and um, Bobby tried to warn me. And we were laughing about this, George and, and some of the guys. Um, and, and I did say to him, I said, I'm doing the same thing you was doing with her. <laughs> you know? But, you know, um, and, and it's so funny. Sometimes you look at a situation that doesn't work out for others. It doesn't work out well for others. And you think that you may be able to navigate through it. You know, um, but I think that some people are better alone. Well, yeah, uh, I interviewed her a couple times. After the, uh, you know, way later, you know, she was mad at me over the documentary, but we talked it out and I basically said, it's nothing personal. And, you know, we, we kept it moving. We did a couple of interviews after that. And uh, she's a beautiful woman. Uh, she's very smart. And she's kind of like one of the fellas. So it kind of puts you in a certain kind of, you know, your defenses get, get kind of lowered around her. And I could see how someone could end up kind of getting caught up with the whole Corinne thing, but... You also have to think about what her background is and the types of books she she puts out. And, you know, you kind of assume, hey, if I do anything with her, I'm probably going to end up in a book. So I, I think I'm good. And, but I was okay with that, though, because you have to understand, I've been on display my whole life. I had braces in front of y'all. I had bad haircuts in front of y'all. I had family members die, and I had to go on and perform in front of y'all. I've had It's all kinds of stuff. So my, I was on display my whole life, so I really wasn't scared of it. The thing for me, man, was, <clears throat> look, Here's the bottom line, Vlad. I, I'm a church boy when, when, it, when it all comes down to it. I'm a church boy who has, uh, you know, family members from all walks of life. Um, and, you know, I'm a musician, you know. Uh, so 
I've never been a judgmental person because I've seen people come into to, to church and, and, and make a complete transformation, which is why I believe that you can turn a hoe into a housewife because I've witnessed it. I've watched, I've watched hoes become first ladies, low key. I've watched pimps become pastors. I've watched some of the coldest killers become the, the first deacons. I've watched gangsters off the street become pastors and have their own, their, 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 their own flock. You know, um, it was my uncle's story who has the church still to this day. Um, you know, so, you know, man, um, I really believe that, you know, Corinne was a, a victim of circumstance who uh, would revert to that, that place of comfort whenever she felt threatened. And, um, you know, man, I knew that it could, it could turn into something. But, you know, like you said, she was the homie you could smash. <laughs> and that's how we got caught up. We met, man, because she played a practical joke on me one night. I was in, in this session. I was producing some vocals on this artist who I ain't going to talk about. But um, um, she played, I fell asleep because the artist was taking forever to drop these vocals. And I just kind of just, just gave up at some point. And I woke up and my nails had white out on them. If you ever try to get white out off of your nails... This is not nail polish. You have to use, like, acetone. You have to use, like, man. And she got all of them. All of them. You know what I mean? So, look, man, you know, I grew up in church, like I said, man, you know, and I'm, I'm a Rasta at heart, you know. So I'm, like, live and let live, you know, and, you know, pass the joint, you know, and keep everything <laughs> airy. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. I don't smoke no more because <laughs> it impairs your judgment. <laughs> Well, I just want to cover one more thing before I let you go. You actually have a, a nonprofit called Father's Care. Yes. And which focuses on, on fathers. You have uh, two children of your own? Um, I actually have three. Three. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a I got a a, um, uh, a little baby. Um I have Zoe, um, and there's Zach, yeah. Those are my kids and um you know, man, um my 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 uh my experience with my son uh, it's led me down a very difficult road, um, and it's it's been a really ugly experience um, of what the court system can do to men who really want to be in their children's lives, man. You know, um, the system wasn't broken. It was designed this way, and what we try to do is we try to work with fathers, <clears throat> excuse me, to help them navigate through through those rocky waters. Um, uh, there's a, 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 an advocate, her name is Kenya. Um, NK or KN um, on Instagram and on Facebook and um, um, it's, it's a cold-blooded hustle man um, child support is for child to support the child not the failed relationships and we've just witnessed um, how fathers have been moved out of the house since the welfare system um, I was a producer on a documentary called where are all the fathers where are all the fathers um, you know, and now we're in a society now where it's very difficult for a man to be a man. You know, um, we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, so much before our very eyes uh, where the protector is being removed from the home, you know. And um, that's what we try to do, man. We try to make sure that, you know, we can advocate, we can help fathers deal with the depression that comes along with the anxiety that comes along with being separated from your child. Um, we go through just as much, you know. They, 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 as women, but we're told, man up, be a man, you know? Well, where, where, what do you do with these emotions, you know? So, you know, that's what we try to do, man. We, we, we try to work with dads, man, because dad, dads have feelings too. Well, yeah, I've interviewed uh, a number of men on my show who really went through a nightmare to try to get custody of their children. Like, for example, I interviewed Matt Barnes recently, and I don't know if you know about the whole Gloria Javon thing, Absolutely. but... Where? All that escalated in this crazy school parking lot fight yeah. where he, he ended up getting full custody of his twins. And he said it cost him about a million dollars to do it. Um, and what he said was interesting was, you know, you know, she got arrested over the incident. He got full custody. But fast forward to today, she never went to prison. And now they have shared custody. Whereas if it was the man in that particular role, he would have definitely gone to prison. And he would not have any custody, probably for the rest of his life. Like I said, I'm in the I'm in the front passenger door. 
I open up the back door and walk around that door and Carter jumps out. I reach across the car because Isaiah is sitting behind the driver, which is Gloria, to reach for Isaiah's hand and all of a sudden she slams, like she puts the car in reverse and like the car door hits me. Um, I lose contact with Isaiah. I kind of stumble for a second. Isaiah falls back in the seat. I'm like, yeah, like, what the fuck are you doing? She tries to drive the car she as you're like push, halfway in the car. She tries to put the car in reverse and back out. So keep in mind that so it's, this is two lanes of traffic at three o'clock where there, other kids are being picked up. Kids are walking, other cars are moving, all this kind of shit. I tell you, man, it's not set up for us to get our kids because it costs me a whole lot of money. You know what I mean? How much do you spend? Legal man, fees. over a million. Whoa, 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 whoa. You spent a million dollars. Because there's in legal other costs. there's other legal costs that I'm currently uh, you know going through with her. Absolutely, and and this is where it is unfair, you know, especially in today's world. You can't have it both ways. You can't want to be independent, want to be you know on the front lines, want to be I'm woman, hear me roar, and then also at the same time saying I'm the weaker vessel. Oh, you know, it 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 doesn't work. You know, there has to be some real balance and. The system doesn't give us any balance. And, you know, Matt Barnes is a real soldier um, <clears throat> for being able to fight the way that he did. But everybody doesn't get those opportunities and those breaks. Everybody doesn't have uh, the financial means to go into court, I mean, and, and, and to fight. You know, because that's what happens in court. I mean, let's face it. You're going in, and the lawyers are the ones who, who, who really end up winning. The children don't win. The lawyers win. That's who makes all the money. I mean, I, I, I got money still on, on, on books with, with attorneys now in, in situations that I was, was able to navigate through. You know, um, uh, with, my, with my daughter, uh, we have a great relationship, you know. Uh, you know and I, I, I just want to just say Tammy's an amazing mother. Um, Amazing woman, and um, you know we went through whatever we went through, but we were able to be wise enough to say this will affect this child's future, and we would rather have this money here for her future, for her trust fund, trust fund versus child support, which is another. Uh, uh, I, I, I hate to say this, but I'm gonna keep it real. It's another systemic tool that is used in the urban community. Um, because we have, we don't even have the knowledge of, of most of us of what a what a trust fund is, but we know how to get somebody on child support. Mm. It's crazy, bro, and, and I'm just keeping it real, you know. Um, but 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 we made an agreement, and 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 we're working past all of that, and 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 I look at what it's doing for my daughter, you know, um, who's just so amazing, you know, and, and and big ups to 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 her mother for being wise enough to understand that, you know. Well, yeah, I just had uh, Tito Ortiz on my show, you know, the MMA fighter, and he had twins with uh, Jenna Jameson, you know, the, the adult film star. Yes. And uh, he said that it cost about half a million dollars with him, and but he's had full custody of his kids for the last, you know, six years, and she hasn't even seen her kids in those last six years. In 2011, um, actually 2012, I ended up... Uh, getting a restraining order and getting full custody of my children. And I've been uh, a father since, and she hasn't been around in six and a half years. And having full custody of my kids, uh, she just walked away. And it's sad, but you know, at the same time, uh, she's, she's, she's a, a victim of her own self. And I try to help somebody I couldn't help. And it took me a lot of uh, physical therapy, or excuse me, rehab to, to really get through those things uh, with a therapist. And it's uh, the things you gotta do as a parent. And it's just, it always gets painted a certain type of way. For a man to get custody of his children is almost unheard of. It's almost impossible. Now, this was so cold-blooded about it with, with my son. I had full custody. I had custody of my son. My son lived with me. And once again, being in the media, um, I taught him how to write, how to read. Uh, he was reading at two years old. Um, I mean, taught him how to walk, talk, all that. Um, uh, and being that... My life, once again, is in the public. Um, we are able to use certain things in the public because it's unfortunately, we're in a society today where somebody can make an allegation and you have to spend all of your resources trying to prove that the allegation has no merit. It isn't innocent until proven guilty anymore. You know, um, a story comes out, it's circulating, and you're stuck with that. You know, so um, it's, it's, it's very difficult and, and almost impossible, you know, but... Um, 
to all you fathers out there, you, you got to just keep fighting and understand that the opportunity will present itself, you know, like Matt. You know, I mean, that was just a break that happened because a lot of times there is a certain sense of entitlement that comes along with, with you know, um, being a custodial parent, unfortunately. And a lot of times it's used to gloat, to taunt, and to take advantage and to bully um, the non-custodial parent, you know. So this is a, a, something that's very close to my heart. And anybody that's watching this interview, um, you know, you reach out to me. If you can't get to me, reach out to Vlad. Um, you know, I'm all about that life because it's about the real best interest of children. It is better, it has been said that it's better to repair, uh, to raise successful men than to re repair broken children, broken individuals. And we're all operating out of brokenness, but we want to try and avoid the brokenness and to raise successful individuals. That's what's going to make this world a better place. That's what's going to make, make a proper contribution to humanity. And, and you ain't got to be on stage to make a proper uh, contribution to humanity. You ain't got to be a singer, an actor. You could be raising the, the, the next president. You, you, you could be raising the, the, the next civil rights leader. You could be raising the, the person that cures cancer. The person, you know, that, you could be raising. That, that's it, because it takes every kind of people, you know. And so I think that, 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 um, that parenting is probably one of the most important positions on the planet. And uh, we have to take it very seriously. And, and it takes a village to raise, raise a child. I'm where I am because of my village. Well, Darius McCrary, man, appreciate you telling your story. Uh, I think it's a very important story with ups and downs and uh, successes and also downfalls. And yeah. it's really, I think, in this world where everyone wants to be an actor, everyone wants to be on TV, everyone wants to be in movies, it's just very important to kind of see the steps involved to actually achieve that and then also to maintain that because it's very easy to be a one-hit wonder in any profession, but to actually continue to do it year after year, decade after decade like yourself, that's where you can see where the real talent actually lies. Man, man, thank you, my brother. I really appreciate that. That means a lot, man. It really does. Thank you for the opportunity, man. It's always a pleasure to be able to sit down you know, with uh, with tastemakers, man, and, and people like yourself who really do understand both sides of the gambit. Because it is a gambit that we run in, man, you know? And sometimes I feel like Eddie Murphy and the Golden Child. I got the knife. Now turn on the goddamn lights. And other times, <laughs> I feel like, where's Waldo? <laughs> but we're going to keep on pressing, man. I feel like the hardest working man in show business today, you know? And uh, and by the grace of God, man, we'll, we'll continue to, to bring smiles to faces and change hearts and lives. No doubt. Until next time. My man. Peace. Right on. Peace.